secrets. Writing to the church at Corinth in chapter 2, he says this. My speech and my preaching were not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith may not stand in the wisdom of man, Sunday, we have to celebrate the power of Pentecost. Now, by the way, he said a lot more things in that chapter 2 than that. He said a whole lot more. But when I think about Pentecost, I think of all the wonderful things it commemorates. I think of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, because Pentecost commemorates that. I think of the the feast of the ingathering or the first fruits, the reality that God has blessed us so abundantly with so much, it's a time of thanksgiving, of celebration. In reality, the power of God's Spirit within our lives is the first fruits, it's a deposit. Because it's a guarantee from the God who cannot lie that anything that He has promised to His Son Jesus Christ is going to come to fruition in our lives. Oh, what power and majesty. It's a commemoration of the birthing and continuation of the ministry of Jesus within the context of the church. Because there's continuity involved, you see. Because the writer of, uh, of Acts, Luke says, I began in the former treatise to write to you of everything that Jesus both began to do and to teach. Meaning that there's a continuation that takes place now in the life of the church. Those who are anointed with his power and his majesty. Now I want you to think, uh, I don't know why the Lord just threw all this into my heart, but maybe somebody need to hear this. Notice what he said in 1 Corinthians 2. We'll get to Acts chapter 2 in just a minute. But he says this. I thank you in demonstration of the spirit and the power, and why? So that your faith will not stand in the wisdom of man. Now I want you to notice that the faith is already an existing reality in the individual's life. He's not saying so that faith can be birthed in your heart. No, he's talking about something that we already have. Now it says when he clearly remember this. You cannot manufacture faith, you cannot purchase faith, you cannot earn faith. Faith is a gift that God gives to every one of us. Amen. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says, He gives to each one of us a measure, a portion of faith. But then once He has given it to us, we have to practice that faith. We have to begin to use it by obedience and the circumstances we are involved in, in order that our faith may be founded upon the right kind of foundation. Amen. Now notice what he says, that your faith may be founded not on the wisdom of man. How can faith be founded on the wisdom of man? That's the point. It can be. The wisdom of man does not build faith. It does not encourage faith. In fact, it doesn't even need faith. Because the wisdom of man thinks it's already got everything I'm down to put together. But your faith must be founded on the power of the Spirit. Now, let me ask you, is it possible to please God? Yes, it is. How? Only one way. By faith. I love what the text says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. The writer says this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith. The wonderful reality of faith. By faith we receive the Holy Spirit. It's an act of faith. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. God doesn't even want us to pay for it. He just wants us to be prepared and ready for it. To receive it by faith. That your faith may stand not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of the Spirit. And he goes on and in verse 9 he says, I have not 
seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Now listen, that is an example. You mean to say that God has prepared things for those who love him? Absolutely. But these things are not discerned by the flesh. We can't see it. The eye hasn't seen it. The ear hasn't heard it. It's not even entered into the heart of man. We haven't been able even to fathom it or to dream it up. But God has revealed it to us. How? By Pentecost. By what Pentecost represents. By the power and the majesty of the Spirit. How do I know? Because He has revealed it. This is not about a church, it's not about a denomination, it's not about a persuasion. It's about being willing to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. I've got a power that I didn't bring it with me. And I know my wife's already saying, wow, where's that power? <laughs> Just think about it for a minute. He has not, how do we know the things of a man? except by the spirit of the man. But the things of the spirit we know by the power of the spirit. God has given us the spirit to reveal his ways unto us. To speak into us. Remember what I said? He doesn't call us servants anymore. He calls us friends. Because he has made us one. Because he has revealed to us the plans and the purposes of God in relationship to the things he has prepared for those that love him. Oh, I'm so glad that I'm one of those. I didn't have enough for him in my own ability and my own strength. It was by the love that he shed abroad in my heart and by the faith that he placed in me that I've been able to respond to him. All we have to do is place our confidence and our faith in Him and ask Him to give us what He has promised from the day of Pentecost. Go, He said, and wait. Go and carry in Jerusalem. Speak aloud until you receive the promise of my Father, which I told you about. That promise has not come to an end. It was fulfilled and it is still being fulfilled in the life of the church, in the life of each individual that by faith will come to him and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And by the power of the Spirit, he enables us. Let me read the text for you. There's a whole bunch more things we can say in 1 Corinthians, but... That's not where we are. On the day of Pentecost, we want to be in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Fati, capitolo 2. And I want to read from verses 1 through 11. And to give your tired posterior a little list. Would you stand while I read these 11 verses? <laughs> and then you can sit for the next few minutes. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I like that. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Like, you hear that, see that word, that comparison, like, a rushing mighty wind that had filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Again, it's the word all anyway. Each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit came. So, with Jews, devout men, out of every nation, listen, out of every nation <coughs> under the heavens. Now, when this was noised abroad, in other words, when this sound was heard, maybe there was 
something that the Bolshev Kennedy and the Ahasel in the year. When this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and they marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how hear we then every man in our own tongue than in we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and sojourners of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Jesus promised those disciples, every one of them, that soon they were going to receive the promise of the Father. They were going to be baptized. Remember what he said? He said it himself in Acts chapter 1. Very clearly he said, just like John said, he came baptized in water, but I am going to baptize you with fire, with the baptism of the Spirit, with fire. Not many days hence. There was, there was a need for fire in the churches today. Some churches have more ice than they have fire. One great man of God that used to minister in New Orleans said this. He said some churches we go to are so dead the only thing alive there is the ivy crawling up the wall. <laughs> because you think we've been baptized in ice rather than fire. What a joy it is to be the child of God. Fire! I was on fire when he sent me at 22 and now I'm 61 and I'm still on fire! Amen. Not because of anything I've got outside of what he gave me. I believe with all of my heart he told them they were going to get power, they were going to get fire because he saw how chicken they were. Without it. Half filled with ice and trepidation, hiding behind locked doors, afraid of the Roman Empire and the soldiers and death. What happened after the day of Pentecost? They weren't any longer afraid. They were not behind locked doors anymore. the Lord of glory. But prior to Pentecost, Peter couldn't even admit that he was one of his disciples. Oh, the transformation of power as it comes upon our lives. Jesus told them very, very clearly, without a doubt, and at the preeminent task of every disciple is to witness of the facts and the realities of the resurrected Christ. People don't need to hear fancy sermons. They need to hear our testimony of how we encountered a living Savior, a resurrected Savior, a miracle working God who still manifests His power and His majesty everywhere He goes. I believe with all of my heart that the baptism is what enabled them to do the things that they did, and it is the very same thing that we need today to enable us to be able, with the fire of the Spirit, to tell people how Christ has risen from the dead. Glory to His wonderful name. Amen. Jesus is not dead. Hallelujah. Mohammed is dead. Yes. I can take you to his grave. I want you to know Buddha is dead. I can take you to examine the place where they buried him. I want you to know, I don't care who you 
want to talk about, the Zoroastrians, uh, the Shinduists, uh, every one of their founders have uh, take you to the tomb, but the tomb of Jesus. Jesus went to the wedding, that somehow he 
he was sort of standing in the corner, sort of looking at the celebration and saying, oh, how frivolous these people are. Look at them dancing and celebrating. Can't they worship God? <coughs> Do you think that when we celebrate, when we celebrate marriage, when we celebrate the birth of a child, when we celebrate any kind of growth or any kind of progress we've made, we're celebrating God. We're glorifying Him. We're grateful to Him. At least our hearts should be. Some of us are so involved in our own thing, I know. We can be distracted. They all came together in Thanksgiving. That word Pentecost means 50 days after the Passover. They counted 50 days and then it was time to celebrate. They would have the first fruits. They would have an in gathering. They were going to bring it together to celebrate God and to glorify His name. <coughs> oh, and what a day it was. Let me tell you something. The baptism of the Holy Spirit came with a startling suddenness on that day. And three unusual uh, phenomena accompanied that momentous experience. Let us have a look at what the Bible says. First, there was a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. A sound from heaven. It does not say that you could see a manifestation of trees bending over and rocks breaking and roofs being lifted because there was wind. No, there was a sound like wind, but it wasn't wind. In a wonderful way, there was a manifestation of the power and the majesty of God. It doesn't mean that there was actually a blowing wind, but only a wind-like sound. But I want you to know the manifestation, the power, and the demonstration of God by the power of the Holy Spirit is always accompanied by sound. You know, wait a minute. The sound might be the celebration of those receiving it. It might be people running on the back of people. Some of us just don't know how to handle the joy that comes upon our life. It might be the sound of tongues as people are speaking in tongues or the prophetic word. It might be the sound of worship as they magnify the name of God. The second phenomenon was the appearance of tongues or flickering flames of fire. And the Bible says it appeared above every one of them. There were 120 in that upper room and on every one of it it appeared. The sign appeared above the head of each of those individuals in that upper room. And as the wind had been a symbol of the power of the Holy Spirit, so the tongues of fire were a symbol of the fire that was mentioned in Matthew 3 and verse 11. When John said, the one who comes after me, I'm not even worthy to take off his shoes. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And that's exactly what happened on that wonderful day. You know what, folks? Wind and fire are symbols of the most powerful forces in the world. You know that? How we've been watching television lately at the tornadoes that have been ripping through North America, tearing up entire cities, homes, and then when the tornadoes move through, gas lines are broken, fires break out, homes are burnt down, millions and millions of square miles of forest burnt to the ground. California, all over the place. Did you know that the results of an atomic explosion of nuclear reaction is fire and wind, and they bring terror with them, wipe out everything as they move. But I'm telling you about the glorious power and manifestation of the Holy Spirit that comes in wind and fire to the glory of God's name. Oh, how wonderful it is does not bring destruction and misery and death, but it brings renewal. It brings hope. It brings cleansing and purifying and sanctification. It brings peace and joy. Oh, the power of the Holy Spirit. Incredibly glorious. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the 24th of December, 1972. And it 
has carried me all these years. 39 years. God has never failed. All joy unspeakable and full of glory. Peace that passes all understanding. Wisdom that cometh from above. When I ask of him dispensing, will it be? It's the power of God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the most positive force in the world. Having been the agent of the Godhead in creation, according to Genesis 1 and verse 2 and Genesis 2 and verse 7, you can find the same in Job 33 and verse 4. I want you to know the Spirit roved over the deep. By the power of the Spirit, God spoke man into existence. Oh, he was there from the very beginning of time. I want you to know that the inspiration of all the scriptures are there as a reality, the power of the Spirit, because it was him as he moved upon men, holy men of God, and they were moved and borne forward by the Spirit that they were inspired to write the scripture as we understand it today. I want you to know he came on the day of Pentecost accompanied by the symbols of power, wind, fire. Woo! I tell you, think of those guys. The Bible says, when they heard the voice and abroad of it. Listen, they came, the Bible says, they came and they heard and they saw. What did they see? What did they hear? They heard the sound. Of a rushing mighty wind. I don't know if you've ever heard the sound of a tornado. I've been there. Oklahoma is right in tornado alley, that's right. And I used to have a sort of bravado attitude towards them. Ah. One day we were standing down on the first floor and our papa was up on the second floor because the storms were coming in and we were sort of looking around what was happening and suddenly the apartment right next door to us, the roof began to fold up like a carpet. <laughs> I mean, I had never seen anything like that in my life. And as it was rolling up the roof, the cars that were in the parking lot that was just picking it up like little toy cars and just boom, 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 all over the place. I wasn't standing there any longer. <laughs> I went to look for a place to hide. power of God through the Holy Spirit will set apart his own from the world. Isn't it amazing how God works? We want to express in our theology what this means, you know, and so we talk about uh, uh, limited atonement and we talk about election and uh, all of these kind of things to express what we mean, but I want you to know God sets aside those he wants to separate from the world. In John chapter 17, that's what Jesus prayed. They are not of the world, as I am not of the world. And so I pray, not that you take them out of the world, but that you preserve them from the wickedness of this world. God, by the power of the Spirit, sets us aside. He also sets apart sinful people whom you will change into the likeness of Jesus. I love that. Oops, the time is gone. Think about, think about Romans chapter 8. I love what he says there. There is therefore no condemnation to those who in Christ Jesus who walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And in verse 29 he says, Those who before knew, he also predestinated to become conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I want you to know, God is conforming us to the image of his son by the power of the Holy Spirit, cleansing out the ways that are displeasing to him, molding us and shaping us and making us anew. And finally, he unites us as the body of Christ. And then he will take the whole body of Christ, the church to meet Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Woo! We're going to be there, brother. I mean, blessed is everybody who is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelations 19. What a great day that's going to be. But the manifestation of the wind and fire was then superseded by 
and make them the tools of the disciple themselves. Verse 4. They began to speak in foreign tongues or languages as the third phenomena that was taking place on this great day. And I want you to know, beloved, the power of the Holy Spirit still falls on people. And to me, it was a reversal of the Tower of Babel. And Babel confused the languages so that there could be no unity among them because they imagined all the wicked and the wrong things. But now by the power of the Spirit, he gives languages so we can have unity and stand as one in one accord to bring about the will and purpose of God. People ask, what's the purpose of this tongues? What do you want to know about it? You don't even know what you're saying anyway. And it's not important what you're saying. It's only important that what God is saying through you. Notice what happened on the day of Pentecost. Everybody there that was from every nation in the world heard in their own language the proclamation of the works Ooh. of God in His glory and His majesty. Tongues are for the unbelievers. When they come in and suddenly they're from a Hindu land or from some Muslim land, they talk some language that nobody in the church knows, and suddenly somebody jumps up and speaking in their language begins to declare the majesty and the glory of God and convicts them. Brings them to a relationship with God. My prayer, do you know everything about the Holy Spirit and the tongues? I don't. I'm still learning. But that doesn't make me weary. Doesn't make me skeptical. It doesn't want me to avoid. I want them to give it all to me. Let it all come to me. Let it all hang out. Let them call me nuts if they like. Let them say I've got a crack in my head. Thank God it was with that crack that the Holy Ghost got into my life. The power. The power of the Holy Spirit. We are told three things in verse 4 and I'm going to shut it down. I wanted to finish right through the verse 11, but we'll do it tonight if we have to. It's not important how much you hear. It's that you hear. Remember, I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him, but he has revealed it to us by his Spirit. Not by the preaching of my prayer. Not by the preaching of Brother David Quackenbush. Not by any other method, the preaching of the word. Now, I want to remind you, where does faith come from? It's a gift from God. But how do we get it? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith cometh by? Ooh. That's why we've got two ears. <laughs> And only one blabber. We're supposed to do more listening than we do yapping. <laughs> but our problem is we do more yapping than we do listening. I said, we. That was a you. We. I'm one of them we's too. Not those kind of we's, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Listen to me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. <laughs> by the word of God. I can take any text, any portion of the word, and I can preach it. And when I'm preaching the word under the anointing, and you are listening by the power of the Spirit, faith is appropriated to your heart. Text says, I believe it. But let me show you quickly what these three things are in verse 4. Number one, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. How many? Oh. Oh. Now, man, you're not convinced. Is it the Word of God or isn't it? Only the apostles, the twelve, only they. No, the woman. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren, and his connections, and the 70 who elected in Luke chapter 10, all of them were there, and they were all. This was only for the apostles. They only needed it so they could establish the church. 
scripture in the fourth century, we didn't need the Holy Ghost anymore. Rubbish. You know what our problem is? We find little big doctrines to teach when the experience is lacking in our own hearts and lives. Right. When we're too terrified to surrender totally and have him take over our being. When we're in our prayer closet and we're really entering to worship and suddenly we feel strange things happening with our tongue, we shut it off because we're afraid. You know what my dad said to me? He wasn't safe now when he said this. My brother was killed six months after I got saved. Nineteen and a half years old. He was a Methodist believer, my brother was. He loved the Lord. And uh, I was going to the funeral. My dad sent me a message. Don't make a fool of yourself at the funeral. He said, don't get back with me. That's how most of us feel about the Holy Ghost. We want to be refined. <laughs> we want to keep our nerves up in the air away from the stage because the truth is we're all dying it's only a matter of how you're going to die we don't know the time but when it comes the only thing that is going to see you through with joy and confidence is that power of God's Holy Spirit The second thing it says, they all began to speak with tongues. Isn't that great? Lord didn't have a few favorites. It wasn't only those who were his disciples that were with him every day. They all, that word all qualifies the entire verse. They all spoke in tongues. Now I'm going to ask you something. You know, we are masters at solidifying doctrines. We want to put God into a box and say, this is how it works. And if we don't see this, you don't have it. Rubbish! Just because you didn't speak in tongues today doesn't mean you weren't tomorrow. Doesn't mean you don't have the potential next year. Or the next moment. It doesn't have to happen like we think it's going to happen. God works in wonderful ways he's wonders to perform. And he doesn't ask our permission or our counsel. I want to be very honest with you. I don't like the doctrinal statement that we write in Pentecostal manuals when we say the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the speaking in other tongues. What we are saying is that all people who have not spoken in tongues don't have it. I don't believe it. Because I believe the potential is in every believer's life and the Holy Ghost comes. And notice who gives the utterance. Not man, not our ability. Oh, in the charismatic movement, I don't want to qualify. Not all charismatics. But in the charismatic movement, there was a, 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 a tendency among them that had this idea that you would have spiritual parents appointed over you when you got saved. And just like your parents taught you how to speak English, so your spiritual parents would teach you how to speak in tongues. Rubbish! That tongue. You'll hear it 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, and it's ticky 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 Rubbish! Lord help me. And number three. excited about the word I have been 
for 39 years and I'm still just as excited. And uh, I want you to know the Holy Spirit is here. Not because I'm here, not because Pastor David is here. Because he promised to be present with two or three in sincerity of seeking his face. Just like God gives good or let's put it this way. This is the illustration he used. I've used it a few times, but I'm going to use it again. Luke chapter 11. Just like you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children. Now come on, which one of us is going to take a snake and give it to our son? I don't even handle those dirty things, right? Snakes? If any of you like snakes, please stay away from me. I don't need any snakes around. In my opinion, the only good snake is a dead snake. And uh, I can help him be dead very quickly. Uh, and a scorpion? If my child asks for a piece of bread, do I give him a scorpion? No. no. Come on. Jesus uses this. He says this. He said, but if you as earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit Woo! to them that ask him? That's it. Ask. Ask with sincerity. Ask with determination. With expectancy. You know, some of us just ask because the pastor wants us to ask. What did you ask him? Ask him, ask him. Let me get the dude off my back. You're not going to get anything. If you will ask, he will give you. Pentecost. Oh, the pastor. Father, thank you. 